Hello. Today, I'm going to read from Saving Winslow, written by Sharon Creech, published by Scholastic Incorporated. And I'll be reading chapters 42 through 49. The next day began well enough, with the sun shining in the windows and Louis pulling on one of Gus's old jackets to wear at school, and his parents getting ready for work, and Winslow prancing around his pen, sniffing the air for spring scents. A day can begin so well. But Mrs. Tooley came outside to scold Louis and his parents and Winslow, all of them, for all that terrible noise day and night. But he doesn't usually bray at night, Louis cried only occasionally. It's too much, I tell you, too much. I'm exhausted. I'm going crazy. Did that health person come? Did she tell you that animals can't stay here? Did that animal person come? Did he tell you the regulations? Louis' mother said, they came. They told us. His father said, we're sorry you've been disturbed. We're taking care of it. His father said, no, Louis did not say anything because his father had placed a cautionary hand on his shoulder. But what he was thinking was, your baby disturbs us. Your baby keeps us, wakes me up. Shortly after Mrs. Tooley went back inside her house, Mac walked up the drive. He looked as if he were carrying a heavy weight on his back. What's the matter, he asked. Claudine. Oh, again? She's breaking my heart, Louie. Mac rubbed his hand down Winslow's neck and back. I wish Gus were here, he said. Louis and his parents silently nodded. I miss him, he said. Louis and his parents continued to nod and sigh on the green. I mean, I know protecting people in our country is important, and I know it's selfish to wish somebody else had gone instead, but I miss him. Sad and mournful, mournful barely audible, yeah, was Luke Winslow's response. Louis was unable to speak. It rained the rest of the day. That night, with the wind, with the rain came the wind, powerful gusts howling through the trees. Twice, Louis checked on Winslow to make sure he was secure and dry in the shelter. Thunder and lightning followed, sudden deep booms that shook the windows and sharp, bright, crackling lights that lit up Louis's bedroom. Louis crawled into Gus's bed and hid under the covers till the storm ceased and all was silent. He hadn't slept long before he was awakened by the sound of Winslow braying. Oh no, Louis thought, not now, not so loud, not in the middle of the night. Mrs. Tooley's baby will wake up and she'll be mad. The brain continued, louder. Oh, please, not now. The brain was loud and relentless. Louis sat up, something was wrong. Louis's first thought as he reached the back door that some, was that someone was taking Winslow and that Winslow was protesting. Louis' father was already in the kitchen. What a racket. What's going on? he asked. Not sure. Going to check. Louis grabbed the flashlight and headed outside. The yard and the pen were muddy from rain. Straw was blown against the wire fence and buckets were overturned. Winslow was kicking his back legs against the fence, agitated and insistent. Easy boy, what's the matter? Louis didn't see or hear anyone. The gate was still latched. What is it? Tell me. As Louis opened the gate, Winslow lunged at him. He smelled of smoke. It seemed to be coming from the garage loft. Dad, Dad! The donkey pushed Louis away from the garage and into the yard, where he turned to the Tooley's house and raised his head, brayed long and loud. Yaw, yaw, yaw! It's okay, Winslow. Okay, shh, quiet now. But then he saw more smoke overhead. It was coming from Tooley's house. As Winslow continued to bray, Louis banged on Tooley's back door. Overhead, the smoke increased, spewing from a hole in the Tooley's roof and from their attic window. And then Louis heard the baby wail and saw lights go on upstairs, then downstairs, and at last Mrs. Tooley burst out the back door carrying a blanket wrapped baby. Winslow insisted on nudging the blanket, murmuring in a small voice that sounded like, please, please. A flurry of sirens announced the arrival of fire trucks, and within minutes, the house was surrounded by firemen and ladders and hoses, and water sprang through the air, lit up by street lights and a yellow glow as the water arched, arched toward the Tooley's roof and Louis's garage. 
who his parents and Mac and his family and dozens of other neighbors gathered, gathered nearby. The storm, the lightning, must have hit the roof. Lucky you got out. How did you... When did you... Nora came running up the street, clad in rumpled pajamas and a sweatshirt. I knew it, she sat up. I knew something was wrong. She put her head, forehead right up against Lou's. You okay? And he nodded. She turned immediately to Winslow, wrapped her arms around his neck. She said the same thing. You okay? Mrs. Tooley was still clutching her baby tightly, and Winslow was still at her side, nudging her baby bundle. You, Mrs. Tooley said to Winslow, you noisy thing, you saved us. After the fireman and Nora left, Mrs. Tooley and Louie's parents sat at the kitchen table in Louie's house. Mrs. Tooley was loopy and dazed. Louie, do you mind checking on Boom Boom? Boom Boom? The baby, Boom Boom. Um, that's his name? Nickname, Louie's mother said. He's in your room. Mrs. Tooley can sleep there, too. You can sleep downstairs tonight, okay? Louie tiptoed into his room. Wary of waking the baby, he was asleep in a portable crib that had been placed between Louie's bed and Gus's. Boom Boom had chubby cheeks and long eyelashes, and on his head a tangled, curly blob of black hair that looked like a burnt cauliflower had exploded there. One tiny hand clutched a corner of the yellow blanket to his chin, and the thumb of the other hand was snug in his mouth. You are the cause of all that loud crying, Louie thought. Louis lightly placed his hand on the baby to make sure he was breathing. He could feel the baby's warmth and gentle rise and fall of his chest. Louis wondered if there was a Mr. Tooley somewhere, and if there was, it must be hard to be away from his son. It must be hard for Mrs. Tooley to be on her own. And then he thought about Nora and wondered how hard it would be to have had a baby brother who didn't make it and a dog who died too. And he thought about Winslow. We never knew his mother. Now odd it would be to be raised by strangers who didn't speak the language. Boom Boom awoke, caught sight of Louie, and launched into a full-blown howl. Immediately from outside came so loud breath. Louie lifted wailing Boom Boom and carried him downstairs to Mrs. Tooley. Listen, he said, the baby cried first, and then Winslow started praying. Get it? Everyone was puzzled. Winslow is a protector. He's bringing because the baby's crying. Winslow is alerting people. Alerting people? Yes. He's saying the baby needs help. Protect the baby. Chapter 46. You'd be proud. The kitchen was a busy place the next morning. Louis' parents were making coffee and pancakes, and Mrs. Tooley was feeding Boom Boom, who was propped up in a baby chair, slapping his hands in cereal and rubbing it on his face and in his hair. Nora was taking it all in, having stopped by to check on Winslow. In the middle of this, Uncle Pete clomped into the kitchen with a loud, Hey there! He had heard about the fire and was making sure everyone was okay. He also had other worries of his own. A coyote had taken one of the newborn lambs in the night. Terrible, terrible sight what was left behind. I don't even want to tell you. Blood and mess and traumatized sheep. Nora pressed a hand to her mouth and muttered, Blech. Louis felt as if something had dropped out of his chest, down through his legs and onto the floor. He didn't want to say anything, but the words came out of his mouth anyway. You need Winslow. There was a moment of complete silence as everyone turned to Louie. Even Boom Boom paused, with his hand in his mouth. Well, his mother was a good sheep protector, Uncle Pete admitted. My LGD. A little gray donkey, Louie said. That's what Gus called her, Uncle Pete said, but it usually stands for livestock guard dog. In my case, I had a livestock guard donkey. Nora was staring hard at Louie. You mean you could just let Winslow go? 
who returned to Earth. Winslow would definitely make a loud ruckus if any creature tried to get near those sheep, right? He could be with other animals and he'd have a purpose. He'd have an important job and he'd be good at it. You'd be proud of him, Uncle Pete said. And we could visit him, right? He asked. Sure, whenever you want, every single day if you like. Nora too? Sure. 47. Chapter 47. The Best of Donkey. That day, Louis and Nora took Winslow for one last walk up to the top of the sledding hill, where they sat and ate bologna sandwiches while Winslow munched the grass. He's a good donkey, Winslow said. The best donkey. Nora added. Winslow turned his head and gave him a long look before returning to his mention. Louis said, I talk to him all the time, not out loud, but in my head, and he listens, and don't laugh, but it seems as if he's talking to me, too. I do the same thing, Nora said. He's very understanding. Louis tossed part of his bread crust to Winslow, who gave it a sideways glance and returned to the grass in front of him, as if to say, no thanks, I've got grass. I'll miss him, he said. But we can visit him, right? Your Uncle Pete said so. We could go whenever we want. We could go every day if we wanted. After school, we could ride bikes out there. Except that... What? I don't have a bike. You can use mine. I'll use Gus's. Chapter 48. Settling in. After school, Louie and Nora walked down the road with Winsler and through the town and all the way out to Uncle Pete's where they reintroduced Winslow to the animals and to his new home with the sheep. Hey there, Uncle Pete said. Want to help me with this? He carried a tray with a syringe and vials. Need to give that lamb its shots. Maybe you can hold it while I do that. Or you could hold it and I could give the shots, Lou said. I know how to do that now. Oh, really? Well, sure then. Go right ahead. I'll hold the lamb. Or I could hold the lamb while Louis gives the shots, Mark suggested. Uncle Pete looked from one to the other and nodded. That would be fine. Just fine. When Louis returned home, his parents were sitting on the front steps holding the mail. Louis' mother waved the postcard. Guess who? The note was brief. Hi, everybody. News. Five days leave in July. See you then. Remember me? Gus. Earlier that morning, Lou had thought he would feel infinitely sad on this day when he had to leave Winslow at the farm. But instead, as Winslow settled in with the ewe and her newborn lamb, and with news of Gus coming home, Louis felt that everything was as it should be. Chapter 49 The Light As Louis fell asleep each night, he saw a slideshow in his mind. Scenes moving by, some slowly, some quickly, some merging with others. The parade of images was different each night, offering up people and places in new combinations. He often saw his parents and Gus and Mac and Claudine. He saw Uncle Pete in the farm, and Mrs. Tooley and her baby, and a girl named Cookie. He saw an indigo bunting atop a golden sunflower, and he saw a thin man on a brown bench. He saw Nora in her bumblebee coat and hat, and heard her say, I knew it. He saw a little gray donkey in his arms, and he saw Winslow with his mouth wide open, bellowing the strangest sounds, and he saw a lamb curled at Winslow's feet at the farm. One night Louis was wakened by a silvery light pouring in through his bedroom window. The light shone a path across the room and onto Gus's bed, and the opposite wall with the painting of a boy and a cat. He wondered if Gus was awake wherever he was, and did he see the same light? He wondered if Winslow was awake in his new home at the farm. Would the light be shining on the sign that Louis had added to Winslow's pen? Remember me, Louis. Chapter 50, 